That's what I wanted to talk about um, tonight. Spirit, our Christian faith, how we use it, how we, or it can be, abused, how we should engage it in this 21st century. And there's a lot of spirit language in this. About, well, let's see, it was last October and November, there was an art exhibit at the University of Rules Belknap Campus in downtown at the Crestman Arts Center. Um, it was the largest exhibit of late sculptor Frederick Hart. Any of you see that or participate in that, experience any of that? The ex uh, exhibit was called Frederick Hart Giving Form to Spirit, a massive uh, collections that occur here. We've got 105 sculptures in bronze and in the acrylic castings, clear acrylic castings that Hart pioneered. I first heard about that exhibit at the back of our sanctuary at Highland. One of our members, Kay Bobola, who's the director of the Louisville Visual Arts Committee, handed me a brochure in late August to make me aware of it, hoping that Highland uh, maybe put a group together to go see it. He did later in, in early in November. But that's the first I heard of it. Frederick Hart, Giving Form to Spirit. And I knew immediately as I read that title that that title, Psalms the Name, was going to be in some future act of ministry for me. Now you know. The title of my sermon is the words of my mouth. It's the meditation of our hearts in these next few moments. Anyway. Lord our God, we take time to pause, to ask that my words and our meditations be acceptable in your sight. You who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Frederick Hart, perhaps best known for a sculpture ex nihilo, out of nothing, a quote, wildly romantic and seething relief panel on the Washington National Cathedral. Maybe you uh, heard of him. The Three Soldiers Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Frederick Hart. His son, Lane, shares that his father, Frederick, was dedicated to the idea that sculpture should endure as a mass medium. In other words, that it should communicate the highest ideals and values of culture to the largest audience. Hart himself stated that if art is to flourish in the 21st century, it must first renew its moral authority by rededicating itself to life. It must be an enriching and ennobling, a vital partner in the public pursuit of civilization. It should be a majestic presence in everyday life, just as it was in the past, art. And so Frederick Hart dedicated his life through the art of sculpture to giving form to spirit. And what strikes me so powerfully about that phrase is that it's been a part of my ministry all of my life and in the formal ministry since I started seminary and began at Highland and beyond. Giving form to spirit is exactly what theology is all about. What religion understood as a system of beliefs or practices that express our experiences of the holy tries to do. In and of itself, giving form to spirit is a good thing, a needed thing as we try to mediate this mystery that's at the center of our lives. It's only when we absolutize our religious convictions, when we teach and preach that our doctrines and our dogmas, our spirit, our sculpture, if you will, is the only expression of the mystery that is God, that the spirit removes itself and we're left with an empty shell, a form with no spirit. And I dare say, my friends, we absolutize a lot. Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu to Catholic, Protestant to liberal, conservative, we absolutize a lot. We create a sculpture, we give form to the spirit, and we worship the idol of our certainty. And I think of the artist. The artist sculpts hundreds of forms for as long as she lives. 
She is aware and she allows that each one is an expression, but no one is the expression. Each one is a form, but no one is the form. How can it be and why should it be? The spirit blows where it chooses. No one knows where it comes from or where it goes. From that third chapter in John, Rachel also read for us from the first chapter, the second chapter of Genesis this evening. I added that scripture because it occurred to me as I was putting these thoughts together that this is the first time in our faith story that spirit is given form. In this second chapter of Genesis, but in this first instance, it's not us, it's not human beings who are acting, who are giving form to spirit. It is the encompassing spirit itself. The one we most commonly call God. True, second chapter of Genesis is the second creation story in our scripture. Creation story one in the first chapter of Genesis. But I always prefer the more relational world, that model of creation in chapter two, where God breathes the world into being. And that radically transcendent creator, operating in total independence that speaks and makes it so in chapter 1. So in chapter 2, God breathes the breath of life and gave human form to spirit. And I suggest to you that from that first breath, we have instinctively been trying to give back, to give form to the spirit that formed and forms us. Ever since God breathed the breath of life and gave form to the spirit through the living beings called human, male and female, we have instinctively been trying to breathe back. We have been giving form to God and coercing ourselves into agreement concerning what we're supposed to believe about the nature of God. And unfortunately, as we become more and more certain that our form is the only true one, we move further and further away from the breath of life that began, that begins it all. Our certainty becomes a vice. And we dedicate ourselves, not to life, but to a stagnant kind of death. So I once again return to the artist's work and words. I'm struck by how powerful it is to substitute the word religion for art in Frederick Hart's most famous quote, the one I read earlier, listen again. If religion is to flourish in the 21st century, it must renew its moral authority by rededicating itself to life. It must be an enriching, ennobling, and vital partner in the public pursuit of civilization. It should be a majestic presence in everyday life just as it was in the past. I suggest to you this evening something not very new at all. Religion, including Christianity, is not flourishing in the 21st century, at least not in its North American context. And in those places where it may appear to be doing so, it is very rarely enriching and ennobling. I further suggest to you that this is in large part due to the fact that most religious claims, including Christian claims to salvation and truth, to the mystery we call God, are most widely understood as exclusivist, contemptuous, and condemning. Now, I don't know, I'm thinking in the past, the numerical and cultural dominance of one religion or another in one region or another Christianity in North America, for example, may have allowed such exclusive interpretations. It didn't make those claims right, but perhaps understandable. But if that was so then, it is certainly not the case now. Our current term the experience of secularism, multiculturalism, religious pluralism compels us to understand faith alternatives, to allow God to be God, to allow the spirit to blow where it will, to be born again, again 